All right, guys, welcome back to another special Saturday tech episode. This is where we do uh, a little bit more information-based stuff for the DIY guys out there and less of the fancy editing for our main build. So do yourself a favor with this episode and jump straight to the comments because anything to do with welding, there's always a great time in the comments. Everyone trying to tell you how to weld. It's just one of those things. It's a worldwide uh, requirement to on other people's welding. Perfect, now we got that out of the way. Let's do some welds. All right, so what we're gonna cover in this episode is just basic welding. So if you're a professional welder, don't even bother watching this, just head straight for the comments. That's where you belong. I'm only doing this video because when I started um, years ago, when I first got into welding, I just wanted to learn the basics of what to use, when to use it, what metals, how to set the different temperatures and speeds and wires and what gas and all that basic stuff. Um, to pretty much get my, my feet wet when it comes to the welding side of stuff. A lot of people do this for a living, they're absolutely dedicated, they treat it like artwork and it looks amazing. You got the small stuff where it's jewelry and it's kind of like soldering stuff together, right up to your massive underwater arc welding pipes and things. So, what you want to do for your basic mid-range stuff is just get yourself a couple of machines. Anything to do on a car can pretty much be done with the sort of stuff I got here. Thanks to Mitch, we welded up a, finally welded up a nice little trolley on here to uh, keep all the welders. A big thing that I've worked out from my experience is you want your welder to be mobile. If you set up a nice little corner and desk with your welders all set up, chances are you're probably gonna to wanna to weld something on your car out on the hoist, so definitely whack them on a trolley. We've uh, built something here, very simple, couple of rows so you can put all the machines on there and the whole thing's portable with the gas bottles and everything. So, what we're gonna to cover today is your standard MIG welding. Um, there is arc welding, which I grew up learning back in the day. It's not really used for the DIY day-to-day -day stuff anymore. That's when you wanna to have tons and tons of like amperage and really strong welds on piping and that it's still used. But for your general stuff, you probably won't need arc welding. Um, but it is an old school way. It's a lot more difficult to do, but it still is used some places. We're gonna cover MIG welding, TIG welding, stainless, aluminium, we're gonna do MIG aluminium with a spool gun, and that'll pretty much get you out of trouble with most things you wanna do on your car around your workshop. So the first thing you always wanna know is what machine to get. Um, I think there is another model, but everything I've got here is Unimig. Now the Unimig Razor is the perfect starting machine. It's a MIG welder and it's a TIG welder, so you can actually change the settings, MIG, TIG, and it can actually do arc as well if you want to, stick welding. Um, I'm not gonna use TIG for this because it doesn't do what I want, but when I started, this will cover most bases as you want because you can plug in a TIG tip and get it all working like that. I have dedicated TIG as well, so that's the uh, Razor Weld 200 ACDC, so it can do aluminum TIG. Um, and now I've got my plasma cutter there as well. We're not gonna cover plasma cutting today, but that is an awesome machine if you wanna get into that. All right, without further ado, let's get into it. So, the basics for MIG welding, let's start with that. Let's uh, widen this thing up a bit. A couple of bits of tools that you want. One thing that I didn't know when I first started, but is super handy once you work it out, is the earth lead on your machine doesn't have to go directly to the part you're welding. If you have a steel table like the one I got here, you can just plug it onto your table and once the part's sitting on here, it'll actually create the connectivity you need, which helps so much when you're trying to put something on that's flat, like this, and you've got to try and stick your earth lead on, it's a pain in the butt. So you can just go directly to a steel table. Get yourself a couple of squares, magnetic squares. Small ones are super handy, big ones are good for bigger stuff. And that'll just keep your, um, your job nice and square when you're trying to weld it and basically get it tacked on and ready to go. So, speaking of tacks, what you wanna do first when you're welding something, the biggest thing that is your enemy is heat. Not so bad with steel, but when you start getting to thinner material and aluminum, it warps a shit ton. When you add heat, it changes the molecules in the material, makes it stretch, expand, and then when it cools, it sucks up and pulls. So, I could probably show an example, but if I laid a weld on a square piece like that and let it cool, it would actually pull and open itself up like that. So to avoid that, you wanna drop a few tacks along your job. So tack it at the end, then tack it at the other end, maybe one in the middle before you start laying a weld all the way across. Otherwise, if you leave one end open, chances are it's just gonna pull away from the job and make an absolute mess. Ready to weld, the next biggest question is settings. And 
A company like Unimig are aware of a lot of people beginning out and they try and make it as easy as they can for you. On my machine, I've actually got a complete table giving you recommended settings. Usually they're slightly cooler than what you want, um, so you can bump up the voltage a couple of clicks, but generally you can start with what tip you've got. Most welders have like a 0.8 size um, spool of wire. So you go down the 0.8 and look at, say we're doing six mil, so that's 20 slash 12. So you whack it on 20 volts here and 12 on the wire speed. Am I on 12? No. 12 on the wire speed. That's a good start. Just a quick one on that. If you're absolutely starting out, Unimig does have the smart set feature where you can set it to smart set, start welding a piece and it'll actually automatically figure out the settings you want because of the feedback that it's giving you and the wire speed. So it's pretty, pretty snazzy if you are starting out. Not the best to work with if you want a good weld, but it gets you on the ballpark. Okay, this is where we start getting to the limit of my experience a bit, and that is how to weld and what technique to use. I still haven't actually worked this out myself, but the way I've been doing it the last few years seems to work fine. So, there's like the normal push-pull, when as you go along, you kind of just push up, pull back a bit, push up, pull back. With MIG, you always want to push the molten metal puddle along with you to keep the heat in the job and get the penetration. When there's a larger gap, or it's a flat piece, or an external kind of uh, weld, you can go side to side. I do this one quite a lot, just crisscrossing to really get the weld into one piece, weld into the other. If you've got a slightly thicker piece and then a thinner piece, you can kind of push the heat more into the thicker piece to try and get the penetration into that and not blow through the small piece. So, let's do a bit of welding there and we'll see how she looks. Alrighty, let's have a look. As you can see, pretty decent weld here. Now we started off a little bit slow and we sped it up through here a bit too much. Here I've gone a little bit wide, but that all in all is a pretty good weld. It's gonna keep it nice and strong. All right, I'm only joking. Look, some of your welds may start like that. Straight off the bat, what's wrong with this one? We don't have any gas on for a start. And number two, we were sitting too far away from the job. So speaking of gas, with MIG, you wanna use a split 5020 argon shielded gas. I think it's argon, which one is it? This one here. There we go. Argon 5-2. And then the only other thing is protection. So with MIG, you want a nice big glove. Um, you don't necessarily need a glove with your shooting hang, but the, where the heat is on the job, if you're resting your arm, you want a decent glove. For TIG welding is when you can get away with a bit of a smaller glove like this one. And obviously a shielded helmet because you'll absolutely fry your eyes and won't be able to see it the next day if you don't have one. So, Unimig sell them. Let's do a proper weld. Alrighty, first actual weld. Now, we are using the recommended settings here and like I said, they usually run them a little bit cooler than they're meant to be. You can see on here is a bit of a peak. So either wire speed's too fast or you wanna crank the heat up a bit. I'm not sure why, if you wanna comment down below why manufacturers always like let it, let the recommended settings be a bit cooler than they should be. Maybe it's to do with like not trying to burn through your material, I don't know. But I'll just show you like from that recommended 2012, we'll bump that up to like, like 22 maybe. And we'll see the difference. It should sit in a bit nicer and not have that crowned edge. Anyway, I'm getting too technical with this. This is a whole basics welding. That's a weld. That's gonna hold for probably the majority of things you're doing unless you're making actual engine mounts and trying to hold your car together. All right, we'll quickly see what this new setting does and then we'll move on. All right, it's sitting in a little more. Okay, so that was an inside edge weld, pretty common. Um, we'll just quickly touch on the different directions of weld you want to work with before we move on to uh, TIG or Ali MIG. Um, when you are making something, one thing that I used to do, and as I grew up, I figured out there was a better way. Either a miter join where you cut your material, say if you're doing like a tray and you have a 45 join on a piece of RHS and you do a nice cut and they butt up perfectly together, you don't actually want that. You want to grind it back to make a little fill so the weld can actually fill both sides and get the penetration. For example, if I have these two pieces of material here, I'm trying to get the focus, and I make it like a join like that where it's completely butted up nice and flush, you don't want that. What you want is to bring that piece out 
So there's a little V in there. What that means is the weld can actually fill that V and give you a way better weld. So I'll do that on here. You can see here, instead of joining these pieces absolutely flush together, there's that little V in there so the weld can fill it. Now with that last weld I did, I did a side to side. With this one, I'm gonna do like a push pull and show you how it will fill that V and actually give a pretty good finish to the point where you won't have to grind that back. Or if you do wanna make it a nice rounded finish, there's really minimal welding to do once you fill it correctly. All right, I'll show you what I mean by filling that weld. You can see there, that is almost a perfect edge. You would barely need to um, grind that back if you want it nice and flush. But that's good penetration. That means the welds entered both sides of the material rather than them being butted up like that, where you put more heat on one side than the other. So just keep that in mind. All right, uh, let's move on to, I'll quickly cover Ali Mig. All right, I'll quickly talk about Ali Mig. Um, I can't find the actual unit. I think Mitch has bloody put it somewhere, but I'm not gonna set it up anyway because it's a bit of muck and around changing the spool. But I will have some footage from when we build the Hilux tray out of aluminium. You wanna use Ali Mig for bigger jobs when you're building like a tray and there's thicker bits of material to put together. But the issue is when you have a Mig gun, for example, a machine that's dedicated to MIG like this, aluminium is such a soft material, as the machine tries to push the weed, uh, push the wire feed through the tube, it'll actually bird's nest and snarl up and not actually feed through. So the spool gun has the wire feed sitting on the gun, so all it has to do is push directly straight out the nozzle, and that way it can weld like normal. You can actually use it on your normal MIG machine, and it's a good shortcut, cheap way to get MIG welded without getting a dedicated MIG aluminium machine. So that welding, you wanna make sure it's super clean. The biggest thing with aluminium MIG I found is cleanliness, actually anything to do with aluminium. It's making sure you have proper shooting, clean your job with acetone or something, and you wanna use dedicated argon gas, not the mixed blend that you use for steel. I suck at aluminium MIG, so does Mitch. We've only just started doing it but we did learn a lot when we built that tray. But the thing with that, when we filled the welds, it was getting grinded back flush anyway. But a new thing for me, probably not something you guys want to jump into straight away. I'd recommend starting with aluminium TIG before you do anything with MIG. So let's move on to that. And now, unfortunately, I can't actually do any demos with the TIG today because yesterday I ran out of gas. So you want pure argon gas for TIG welding. Now, just off the back of the aluminium, any welding in fact, but aluminium is really bad, is the flash off of it is absolutely brutal. If you don't have long sleeves on, I'm so bad for welding without a shirt on and I get the worst burn. It's worse than sunburn, so bad for you. So make sure you do have long sleeves on and gloves and a helmet. Even if you're not looking at the world, if your mate's over there and you get a side flash, you can actually burn the side of your eye. So keep that in mind. Quickly, we've got lots of footage of me TIG welding. This is what I use for like stainless um, building exhausts, dump pipes, snorkels, any of that. Use the tungsten tip uh, with the, uh, the Unimig kit. They have a red and white tip end. Now the red one is for uh, steel or stainless. Um, you wanna make sure that's super clean, put a point on it, use a drill and just clean the end of it on a little die grinder or some rotisserie you've got, a sander. Um, because the arc will shoot out of that point perfectly to actually get a nice weld. If you accidentally touch it on the material, get a double weld on there, it'll start shooting off in random directions and make your weld look absolutely shit. So TIG's all about patience. Um, you're hovering over the job with the filler rod. A lot of the time you can just start with fusion welding where you set the machine to like a DC pulse and you'll hear it kind of tick at a certain beat. And as it ticks, you want to move along and basically stack the bits of weld on top of each other. If you've done a perfect cut on a piece of stainless for a snorkel, for example, you can usually get away with just fusion welding the whole thing because there's no structural integrity for that anyway. But if you're doing something more structural or an exhaust pipe or a V-band end, you wanna start adding filler and it just adds another element where you gotta think about your hand feeding that rod and keeping the TIG keeping up with that. Same deal with aluminium. I find aluminium TIG quite easy in the fact that you can sit on the job a bit longer. If you sit on steel, it'll blow through. With aluminium, when you change the tip to the white tip, use the aluminium filler rod, you can actually get the pool of alley looking shiny and sitting there, 
And you can kind of sit there a bit longer before it blows through. So you can do it a bit slower, like sit there, dab it, move along. Sit there, get it pulling up, dab it, move along. Um, that's good for like intake piping. I do a lot of intake pipe. The Duramax build was a lot of aluminium TIG. The XC we're building at the moment has a ton of that coming up um, where we're gonna aluminium TIG. And I find that leaves a better finish than using the aluminium MIG gun. So unfortunately, uh, sucks I can't show examples of that, but I would have overlaid a lot of footage of me doing it from other builds. Um, but the setup I've got here pretty much covers everything I want. I can do MIG, thick steel with that MIG machine, throw the spool gun on and do aluminium MIG if I want to do bigger alley stuff, jump to the TIG for the stainless finish on piping exhaust, and then go to aluminium TIG for doing the little stuff like toolboxes for the tray or intake piping, all that kind of stuff. So it's a super basic overview, of what gear to use, how to get started. Don't listen to people whinge, everyone starts somewhere. My welds are still atrocious. People, the, usually the people that are commenting on your welds are the guys that do it for a living, day to day, all the time, and they're absolute perfectionists. They love welding, especially when you get into TIG. It becomes a little obsession because it's like art. You want to get it as good as you can and other people watching are just out there to judge you. So don't worry about that. Get stuck in, start doing welds. If you build something on your car and it breaks, then you know you want to weld it better next time. Do your worst in the comments. I'd love to read them. Oh, make sure to subscribe too because these Saturday episodes are a lot extra work for me, but I'm trying to make them a little bit more information based where the younger guys who are coming in. The OGs built not bought. They're like, Sam, you used to teach us a lot of the skills and things and now it's more just punching out the builds uh, for the entertainment. But I do want to come back on these Saturday episodes to show you a bit more stuff. I think in a couple of weeks, I'm going to do one on 12 volt wiring where I'm wiring up the XC. Not something I'm going to film for the major episode. It's super boring and not that exciting to film, but I'm going to run through some stuff for you guys that want to learn a bit about 12 volt because that is a ground up wiring job. There's not a single wire in that car and we're going to start from scratch. So we'll see you on that episode.